I think now uh, I invite uh, Dr. Subin Bhattacharji, who has been inventor. He's in a pioneer in the field of cataract surgery. And today he's going to talk about his very uh, you know, own interesting area of a small pupil. How do we manage uh, small pupil in phaco surgeries? Dr. Subin, please. Thank you, Professor Titiel, for this opportunity to speak on this topic, which is very close to my heart. Uh, FECO in small people, if you're talking of small people, IFIS can't be very far behind. Uh, I'm Subin Bhattacharji, and I do have a financial interest in the BX Pupil Expander. So why is small people a problem? When the pupil is four millimeters instead of eight, the surgeon's viewing area is actually reduced by to a quarter. So that leads to vision-threatening complications. Again, IFIS is unpredictable. So let's take a look if iris hooks can prevent IFIS. Now this is a paper, the presentation which I did in 2013 in Arup's course in uh, ACRS. Now, this is a case of severe IFIS where despite iris hooks, I had the iris prolapsing even before I could complete my capsular excess. I had a frayed iris and I had a tough time through the surgery. We managed, but the idea is that even iris hooks do not prevent IFIS. Now, so can pupil expanders prevent? Well, unfortunately, no. So you can see my iris pro prolapsing through the side port, and uh, very shortly you will see that it's prolapsing through the main incision as well. So no device technically prevents IFIS. <clears throat> so what we have is meiosis. Iris hooks and pupil expanders provide a constant pupil size which offers good visibility for safe phaco emulsification. Now, as far as iris prolapse is concerned, actually no device can pr help. It's dependent on the severity of the iris and the pathological damage to the stromal mu stroma and the muscles. So if you get away on one day with one device, it's just your good luck. The IFS was probably a lower grade. A question which I often ask you to ask yourselves is, if you are going undergoing a cataract surgery with a four millimeter cataract, uh, pu pu non-dilating pupil, what would you prefer your surgeon to do? Use a skills or prefer use a device? I think we've burnt our fingers enough. So that's the long list of drugs and conditions which can cause IFIS. So no amount of history taking can be really foolproof. So it's, it remains unpredictable and you can be, it just come as a bolt out of the blue. Can we uh, diagnose in advance pre-op by a pupil size? Unfortunately, again, no. A pupil size seven millimeter or more smaller, even without history of alpha blockers, can lead to IFS. In India, the incidence is much higher. And hypertension has been found to be a big risk factor in, for IFS. Fortunately, surgeons have reduced the threshold for using a device because of the unpredictability of IFIS, uh, exacting patient expectations, and unforgiving nature of the premium technology. Uh, Chang and Campbell in 2005 taught us that unlike the non-elastic myotic pupil, the IFIS pupil immediately snaps back to its original size following attempts to stretch it. So we need to understand that mechanical dilatation of the pupil is not going to work in IFIS. It would work in the rigid or fibrotic pupil. <clears throat> so there are two types of pupil, the elastic or the non-elastic. The elastic pupil is like a rubber band. You can stretch it with any device and any expander would work. The, uh, the rigid pupil is more like a string, so you can tear it. It's tearable or breakable. So you need a bulky pupil expander to tear the, uh, uh, the, the thing, sphincter or actually use Kuglin hooks to make it stretchable. <clears throat> we could always check the elasticity of the pupil before we start by just injecting a little BSS through the side port. If the pupil expands momentarily, you know we're dealing with an elastic pupil and any device would work. But if it does not budge or just minimally expands like this, you know that you're dealing with a fibrotic pupil. It's best to probably use two Kuglin hooks and stretch it a little to render it expansile so that and now uh, you could use, hereafter you can use anything, iris hooks, pupil expanders, whatever you choose. So what matters most is the elasticity of the pupil and not the size. So what would be a good size? Now I'm sure all of us will agree that if we are given a situation where it's said that a 5.5 pupil is not going to get any smaller, we'd all be very comfortable operating in it. So whether you use a pupil expander or iris hooks, do not stretch beyond 5.5. That's good enough for any hard cat rack. Let's see this video by Deepak Meghur. Pseudo exfoliation, small pupil, rigid pupil. So a little bit of stretching renders it elastic or stretchable. And then a BHEX device gives you a 5.5 millimeter pupil. This is a pretty hard cataract, as you can see. 
and as long as you chop it into small fragments, you can really overcome the uh, difficulty. A good tip is to keep the anterior chamber underfilled with viscoelastic. We have the tendency to inflate it. Iris bowing, actually, if you underfill it, and uh, there is iris bowing, it helps in hooking the pupil margin and tucking out the flanges that create space. In fact, if you overfill the anterior chamber, you plaster the iris down to the uh, anterior capsule that leaves no room for the uh, iris hooks or the, the pupil expander. For uh, incision 1.8 or anything larger, the BX practically it's a walk in the park. You can take the device through the incision very easily. It's a very thin device, ultra thin device, and I mean it doesn't require any great skill. There is hardly any learning curve. Tuck alternate flanges under the pupil margin, and you have a very comfortable 5.5 pupil to do your surgery. The device does not come in the way of IOL implantation, the FACO probe, or anything else. It's practically you don't feel its presence in the antechamber because it's just 75 microns in thickness. Now, if you would want to go in through a much smaller incision of 1.2, you could do that. But then what you need to do is uh, keeping the flange across the incision, it's a bit difficult to push it through. So you need to hold the flange. Now, you can see over here, you, if you, once you hold the flange in the middle, it will not go in very easily. It doesn't, in fact. It distorts. So you hold the flange at the end and align it to the incision, and it goes in pretty easily. And the rest of the surgery is as routine. Now, it's so thin. It's the thinnest pupil expander, so it can come out through a 0.9 or a side port incision. It's hair thin. All you need to do is grab that uh, flange through the side port, advance it centrally, disengage the two notches, and then drag out the device, and it walks out pretty smoothly. A little bit about iris hooks. Uh, I'm sorry, I've not done iris hooks in a very long time. This is a very old video. You can see it's a 4 to 3. And I like to keep the paracentesis clear in the clear cornea, just directed a bit posteriorly. And I like to make these nicks in the conjunctiva so that you can find those incisions later. And it's not very embarrassing. Uh, it's a good idea to retract that stopper well in advance, otherwise it gets embarrassing. Hook the pupil margin and do not with, with retract it all the way. This is a little over-retracted. You really don't need so much of pupil expansion. Those were the days when we liked to see our pupil very big. Uh, keep the capsule access to your plan. Uh, stick to your plan. Do not get carried away by the expansion of the pupil over here. Remember that the pupil margin is now elevated to the limbal plane, and there is an anti-flexion of the iris also. So every device that goes in is going to knock that iris, and it's going to lead to uh, trauma. So be mindful of that. You just negotiate around it. So for removal, you just need to hold that stopper and push the iris to advance it, and then just pull it out. It momentarily straightens and comes out. Very easy. Don't need any heroic maneuvers. Uh, my concerns with iris hooks are basically um, a risk of infection because of theoretically at least more incisions, iris sphincter tears, and the corners are actually wasted space. We don't really, uh, we are not using that space. We are working only within the capsule excess area. Then, like I said, the pupil margin is elevated to the limbal plane, so that is an issue. Your anterior chamber gets a little cramped over there. And of course, it's documented that uh, iris hooks take more time than pupil expanders. And if you've had a bad IFS and it's been a tight situation, this would be the marks. These would be the marks you'd see on the iris in the post-op period. I've run, run out of time. Okay, so you need a, a, a device which goes in through very small incisions. Uh, Intraop meiosis again, it's. Uh, Easy to have a device where you can see the capsule X margin as you uh, negotiate. So I'll just advance this a little so that we can. Uh, so inject a little viscoelastic under the pupil margin, take the device and tuck it under the pupil margin, advance it. And as you advance it to the periphery, you uh, have instant confirmation that you've not engaged the capsule X margin. And that way, you're absolutely sure. This is the only device which allows you the uh, visibility. Other devices really don't allow you to see what's being engaged. And well, we'll skip this. There are a couple of videos at the American Academy. So my choice of people expander in intraoperatomyosis would be either iris hooks or a BHX ring. If it's a sublaxate cataract, there is no two opinions about that. It's absolutely iris hooks because you can do segmental people dilatation as you would like. I would encourage you to look up this. Uh, uh, 
PDF document, which has got uh, useful instructions, and this, this article that's available online. Thank you very much once again, sir, for the, this thank, opportunity. Thank you, Dr. Suvin, for showing a fantastic videos and explaining the advantages of you know, using your BX rings. I think devices have made life simple for a difficult situations. Thank you for showing all those.